Oh. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 20. I had intended to teach something different, but this is what the Lord had given me to look at this morning. So, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, we have what many call the great white throne judgment. Some may refer to it as the last judgment or the final judgment. I don't intend to debate whether there's one judgment or two judgments, one, one for the just, one for the unjust. Or, uh, let's debate a lot among Christians. But I'd just like to look particularly at this judgment. Beginning in verse 11, it says, John writing here, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small, and great stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If my understanding is correct, this is after the thousand year reign. Mm -hmm. Satan is loose for a season, and the, that final bat battle is fought. Then all nations, if you will, are gathered before God for judgment. Mm -hmm. He says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. When I read this, I thought of what a sight to behold. Amen. God on his throne. We see a glimpse of this back in Isaiah. Uh, Brother Larry likes this passage, Isaiah chapter 6. If you can turn there and read that. Amen. Isaiah 6, I, Isaiah here got a glimpse of God on his own. Mm -hmm. We'll go ahead and read verses 1 through 4. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the, also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Amen. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. If just this little glimpse that Isaiah had, I can't imagine what it would be like when God in all of his glory is there on the throne. For us that are saved, it will be a wonderful sight to behold. Amen. But as we see back in our text here, it's going to be a terrible sight for those that mm. don't know Christ as Savior. You know, so the next part of verse 11 says, And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So the wicked will certainly attempt, if you will, to flee from God at this time. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of Adam and Eve in the garden when they sinned. They tried to hide from God the same. We don't have to turn there, but Genesis 3, 8 tells us they hid themselves from God. Right. You know, obviously, you can't hide from God, though. Right. Well, he, of course, said, Adam, where art thou? But not that God needed to know where Adam was, but that Adam needed to know that God knew he was hiding. Amen. We'll turn over in a minute to Exodus with Moses. When he was in sin, he had from God too. Right. But it says there was no place found for them. There's going to be no hiding place from God. Amen. Jeremiah 23, 24 tells us that there is nothing hid from his sight. Right. But we, in this life, we sometimes we try to hide things. Mm -hmm. you know, we might hide it from you know, the church, the pastor, or the boss, or spouse, whoever it may be that we're trying to hide it from. 
other men, but we won't hide things from God. Amen. All things are open and naked in His sight. Hebrews tells us. Look, so this is quite different from how the saved react to seeing God, though. Mm -hmm. Let's turn back to Job for a moment. And then we'll go over to Exodus. Job in chapter 19. Job was Job was excited, if you will, to that he would one day see God again in his flesh. Job 19, verses 25 through 27, I think we have all heard these verses before. It says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Amen. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Mm -hmm. whom, shall I, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reign be consumed within me. Amen. But if we don't have that same desire as Job did, I think we would do good to examine ourselves. Amen. That looking forward to that day when we shall stand before God, we shall Amen. be with Him. Well, that may seem foolish or unreasonable, unlogical, whatever the term we want to use to the world, that those that have been dead for thousands of years, yet in their flesh they shall see God. Amen. But what really is our our great hope, if we will, that we will see Him in the flesh. So I'm not going to start preaching, but this life is not all that there is. You got it. And if there was, we would be all men most miserable. Amen. Let's go back to Exodus and look at Moses for a moment. Exodus chapter... Three first, and then we'll go over to chapter 33. I guess the speaker died on me. Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, when Moses had been running, if you will, after he had killed the Egyptian and Right. He thought no one was watching him. He fled off. He fled to Midian and married uh, Jethro's daughter. Right. <clears throat> I can get to my passage here. Let's go ahead and begin in verse one. And read through verse six. It says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro his father and all the priests of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. He at first he marveled, if you will, he was intrigued by this burning bush. <laughs> Notice as he goes on here, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where on thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Mm -hmm. This is a stark contrast to how it would be 30 chapters later. Right. We'll go over there. See, he, Moses was not, quote unquote, right with God, if you will, at this point in his life. Right. And he was, when God came before him, he tried to hide himself from him. Sin always separates us from God. Amen. Like that's very plainly said in Isaiah chapter 59. The Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. Amen. The problem is always with us, sin, not with God. All right. Let's go over to chapter 33 and see 
this change, if you will. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 33, verses 18 through 23. You know, Moses had been conversing with God about the people going into the promised land and wanting the presence of God to go with them. But here it comes to this point, and he, that's Moses, said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Mm -hmm. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. That is God speaking now. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will have show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Amen. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Amen. Even Moses not to say he didn't care, but he was not concerned, if you will, that he was, his life would be taken, I think, at this point. <laughs> right. Amen. He was more concerned about seeing God. But we should be more concerned about seeing God, if you will, than the things of this life. Amen. Yeah. When uh, Paul was told to go to Jerusalem, all the other apostles and those around him told him that wasn't too good of an idea. But he said that he was going bound in the spirit, not knowing what shall befall him there. Amen. Neither count I my life dear unto me, he said. I'm not saying we should be careless, but we should not count this life so dear that we would be willing to sacrifice our service for God. Amen. Anyway, let's go on here. And it says in verse 21, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passes by, that I will put thee in a cliff, or in a cliff of the rock, and will put thee <coughs> with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. You know, rest, he would see the, just this glimpse of the glory of God, he would shine so brightly that he would be veiled. And just imagine what it will be like when we stand before God in all of His glory. Amen. So I bring all this out to show what greatness it will be for us. And on the contrary, how terrible, if you will, it will be for the wicked. Right. Let's go back to Revelation. We'll continue on in our text here. Revelation in chapter 20 again. Verses 12 and 13, here is the, the judgment part, if you will. It says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Amen. Yeah. We see the all stand before God here. Right. It says the dead, small and great, were before God. Those that were in the sea, those that were, it says death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And there's a great push today for everyone wants to be judged. You know, only God can judge me, they'll say. Well, one day they'll be judged by God and I think it's going to be as good as they thought it was going to be. Amen. Right. Man is a lot more lenient than God is when it comes to sin. You got it. But no, there's not going to be exemptions, if you will. Mm -hmm. The rich man will be here. The poor man will be here. The, it was the great man, the small man, the Men of great power, the men who just average Joe, if you will, mm -hmm. and they'll all be on an even field. Not going to be like the rich had their own judgment over here, and the poor had their own over here, and they'll all will be judged according to their works. Amen. In fact, the rich man, he will not have his riches to present before God at that point, will he? That's it. By this point, they will all have been melted away with the per great urban heat. You know, besides that, First Timothy tells us that we brought nothing in this world and certainly can carry nothing out. I've seen men, and it was the practice of the 
the Egyptians to bury their treasures with them, to take it into the afterlife. Mm. There's no taking it with you after yeah, this man. You know, nothing wrong with having possessions. The Lord gives you those, but be sure you're not going to take it with you. Mm -hmm. you could, I've seen the one person who they made a special casket for him to sit up on his motorcycle and buried him in it. Guess what? He didn't take his Harley in eternity with him. There you go. The rich man and over in Luke, he opened up his eyes. There you go. He didn't have his riches around him, did he? Mm -hmm. No, even the, the great and mighty men will not be able to they really will be just as powerless as the weakest of men at this point. Think of Pharaoh. He was a great and mighty man. He was, had a vast empire in his day. Yet he will stand equal to the beggar that lives under the bridge in Clarksville. Amen. Amen. Just as weak and powerless as the same. And all will give account before God. Right. <clears throat> You no, know, those who were you know moral or righteous, they really have nothing to cling to either, will they? Right. There's a song that's called "The Great Judgment Morning." Uh, one of the verses it talks about the moral man who came to judgment, but the self-righteous rags would not do. The next line caught my attention, though. It says, "For the man who crucified Jesus passed off as moral men too." You think about it, the, the Pharisees, they were the religious elite of the day, and they're the ones who had Christ crucified. So morals and self-righteousness will not do when you stand before God. You're right. In fact, let's turn to Luke chapter 18. I'm sure we've all heard this passage before, but... It's a clear example, I know of in scriptures, Luke chapter 18, verse number 11 through 12. We have the two who went up, I believe verse 10, that went up to pray. It says, two men went up in the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. First we have a Pharisee here. It says, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. He, he, he was not a wicked man by man's standards, was he? Right. I mean, he was not, it says here, he was not an extortioner, he wasn't an adulterer, he wasn't unjust, he wasn't publican. Publicans, they were usually thieves and dishonest people. He even goes on to say, I fast twice in a week, I get tithes of all that I possess. So he did good deeds, quote mm -hmm. unquote. But really, none of that matters, does it? And the publican standing far off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. Amen. You know, I don't think there was necessarily anything wrong with what the Pharisee was, his deeds, if you will. It was the way he conducted himself. It was good right. not to be an adulterer, an extortioner, or unjust. It's good to be fast twice in a week and give to high, but right. if you do it to say, look at me and look what I've done, yeah. mm -hmm. you've done it for the wrong reasons. That's how many today live, isn't it? Look at my good works, look what I have done. Right. Everyone's going to be judged according to their works, it says, but everyone's going to be found lacking. Mm -hmm. I know I've used this example before here and other places. You know, men think that their good works are going to outweigh their bad works, but if you have a, a scale, your bad works will always outweigh your good works. That's it. Amen. And going along with what Isaiah says, uh, all your righteousness are as filthy rags. All of these good works are tainted by sin anyway without Christ, so you're really just left a pile of bad works. Mm -hmm. When we try to present that before God's judgment, it's going to be no good. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be kind of acceptable in His sight. No, all these 
angels will be judged according to their works. These books are going to be open, it says. You know, I know there's some debate about what these are. I think, at the very least, it's the books of the Bible, perhaps. Mm -hmm. A book of counts of things you've done in your life. Mm -hmm. And it does say, specifically, the book of life is going to be there. Amen. Mm -hmm. Do you know, the book of life is what's really going to make the difference. Very good. <clears throat> For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God, Romans 3 tells us. It really doesn't matter how moral or righteous we are in this life, but we don't know Christ. If our names are not written in the book of life, if we will. So death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death in verse 15. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. <coughs> Do you know Christ as Savior? Is, have you been born again? Have you experienced that saving grace? But whatever terminology you want to use, do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? That's what makes the difference. Amen. Well, I, you know, some say, well, this has to be one judgment because of, of this verse. That we have care very well could be that the Book of Life was just there as a confirmation to show that none of these were going to be saved anyway. Hmm. You know, those who spent their whole lives doing good deeds, but yet doesn't know Christ the Savior, it's not going to make much of a difference. Amen. You know, Gandhi was a, he had a lot of good ideas, didn't he? But as far as I know, he was never born again. Right. And Mother Teresa, he, she's venerated yeah. among the Catholics and among many other people. If she didn't know Christ the Savior, she'll stand before God. A sinner just the same as the rest. Right. You know, just the same as Wicked men such as Hitler and Pharaoh and Stalin. We use these two extreme examples, but like I said, the average person is going to be there just the same. There you go. It doesn't matter if you went to church every Sunday if you don't know Christ as your Savior. Uh, Amen. It doesn't matter if, even if you were a quote, quote, member of a good sound church if you didn't, if you've never been born again. Mm -hmm. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. And according to the, to the verse 10, this lake of fire burns and shall be torn. Those that are there shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Mm. So forever and ever doesn't have an end, does it? There you go. And on the flip side, for us that are born again, we have forever and ever of eternal glory, if you will, eternal Bliss beholding our Savior and fellowship in where sin is done away with. And as uh, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, and so shall you ever be with the Lord. I think that alone ought to thrill our hearts as the child of God. That's right. We shall be forever with the Lord. Amen. And you know, I've heard a lot of people propose ideas about what's going to be in heaven, but I don't know that any of it matters except Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. right. You know, the new Jerusalem that's described here in Revelation talks about the streets of gold and gates of pearl and all that, the walls of jasper. But really, all that will compare to the glory of God. Amen. Right. Amen. And that's what we will behold for all of eternity. Amen. For those that aren't saved for all of eternity will be really eternal torment, eternal damnation. Right. Well, I'm not, I don't want us to try to scare people into being saved, but I don't think there's anything wrong with warning them for what right. is ahead. Yeah. Amen. Judgment is coming, and even for us there, the children of God, we must give an account for the deeds done in this body. Amen. I think Romans very clearly tells us that. Amen. So shall every one of you give an account of himself before God. Mm -hmm. I think it's in 1 Corinthians also that tells us that we will give an account for the deeds done in this body, whether it be good or evil. We don't get a get out of jail free card, if you will. There you go. 
because we won't stand condemned before God, but we will give an answer for how we served Him, what we've done, how we failed Him. Right. But oh, for the wicked, how it will be a terrible day when you stand before God without Christ the Savior. Mm -hmm. He's the only one that can plead because He's the only one that can be your advocate, if you will. Mm -hmm. There's no priest going to be there on that day to. Uh, the pastor's not going to stand up and say, well, he was a pretty good church member. Mm. Uh -huh. well, in fact, the pastor himself could be there if he does. I don't think, I'm not saying Brother Larry's going to be there with the wicked, but just being a pastor doesn't exempt one from it. Amen. Amen. Sure. Right. <laughs> Well, we ought to always be like Brother Larry said, make our calling and election true. Mm -hmm. sure. yeah. If you don't know Christ, say we're always going to you to Him. Amen. Amen.